All right, we're moving on to part five and the last part of physical notes like this, part six, um, aquaculture, specifically marine aquaculture called mariculture, will be carried out um, later this week in a different method. Okay, so um, in your notes, um, this is page 120, slide 126, page 22, so make sure your name and period are on top. And um, this takes place after the last one, which was method. So this is rest restrictions on size. And it's pretty clear where fish are to be measured from, from the tip of the tail to the tip of the snout, okay? Um, <clears throat> that's what this part says right here. And it's done at the point of catch and thrown back at the sea immediately if they're undersized, because otherwise you're killing something that you don't need to kill, okay? Um, this is done both commercially and for the individual angler who, like you or I, who are just going out to the pier or out on their boat or out on the beach and throwing in a line and pulling up a fish. If you catch a certain species, you have to be um, knowledgeable about species and regulations so that you don't get in trouble. You're fishing and some, you know, an authority can walk up and say, show me your license, one, show me what you have in the cooler, two, um, and what kind of gear are you fishing with? So you have to be knowledgeable about that. So here's some examples that, um, this, these parts are not in your notes, but so um, they're all labeled different species. So this is a bass, uh, cod, sole, haddock, herring, whiting, and plates. And this is the landing size in centimeters of all the different fish that are regulated. <clears throat> now, we have similar species here in Florida, like uh, herring for bait fish, and we have flatfish here. And we do have bass, with so sea bass as well. But some of these other ones, like cod and, and um, haddock, those are cold water, North, North Sea, North Atlantic fish. Here you got a special tool to measure the carapace of lobster if it's within legal size. And like everything else, there are advantages and disadvantages. So the advantages are always the same thing, protecting the environment, okay? And the disadvantages are um, usually have to do with bycatch or regulation. <clears throat> And the next part of uh, intensity, so pay, uh, slide 129. Controlling the fishing uh, intensities by restricting factors like number of boats. Sorry, but your, 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 your industry is, you know, your company is only, you're only allowed to have a dozen boats, 20 boats, whatever, for this type of fishing. Size of the boat, engine size, number of boat days. How many, in other words, how many days are you allowed out on the water? And then fishing gear sizes. So, and of course, fair allocation is given to all fishers and a fleet. So we're gonna move on to methods of monitoring, but we have a couple slides here. Well, the, the uh, Advantages and disadvantages, of course. So, um, advantages, again, helping the um, fish stocks, okay? Making enforcement easier. Regulating is um, simpler. But then, employment. And can be expensive to monitor and enforce. Oh, so, you're going to have anglers out there, you know, save our save our sea, our waters, that's false. Saving our heritage, but I, I mentioned this in class last week to somebody, I forget who it was, maybe not this class, but I said, just because a culture is ingrained into someone's background, 
something in their culture is what I'm saying, doesn't mean that it's right today. You know, if you look at how much fish is a part of, of Japanese culture, for example, okay? Lots of cultures, but lots of things about Japanese culture that used to be are no longer considered good things, right? Like the wife used to have to walk six feet behind the husband, or they used to bind women's feet to make them small, um, you know, things like that. That's part of culture, but that doesn't mean that it's right. So just because these people say it's part of our heritage, it doesn't mean that it's right what they're doing, right? So they're misguided. Things, oftentimes change is good. Sometimes it's not, sometimes it's good. You can't generalize or stereotype that kind of thing. Okay, so methods of monitoring. How, how is this all being looked at? You know, how is this possible? So there's four different um, aspects we're going to talk about here. Air and sea patrolling, that seems like the most obvious one, right? Satellite tracking. 21st century, more advanced. Another obvious is inspection of catch and fishing gear. This has been going on for a lot longer than any of these other things. And then this thing called catch per unit effort, CPUE, we're gonna talk about that um, right now, okay? And what are the reasons? Um, we, fairness, fairness is, everything is fair. Okay, there are methods of monitoring safety on the highway, right? So, you, the, you are driving down the road at 80 miles per hour, the speed limit's 70. The person in front of you is also driving 80 miles an hour, okay? The person next to you is going faster than you, 85 miles per hour, and they're passing you. You see blue lights in your mirror and you get pulled over. And the first thing in your mind is thinking, this isn't fair. The guy in front of me was going just as fast as I was. The guy next to me went by me five miles an hour faster. Why am I getting pulled over? That's not fair. Well, you're the one who got caught, okay? You're the one who the cop saw with the radar gun. You're the one who had you, you, you just, it's the same thing with um, bank robbers, okay? Three of them rob a bank. Two of them jump the fence faster than you. You don't jump fast enough, you get caught. It's not fair that only you got caught. You can't think like that. That's just the way it works, okay? So in, in their attempts to be fair, sometimes it doesn't seem fair is what I'm trying to say, but it is. There could be a 200 fishing boats out there, and you're the one that the, that the patrol comes to, to check and stop. Even if you didn't do anything wrong, you're the one being inspected. So it's all about perception. And the other, these other things that you should have gotten by now, preventing illegal fishing, obviously, um, and enforcing those quotas. Okay, so let's talk about each one of them individually. So we're gonna start with air and sea patrolling. It's very, again, again very basic. Um, Coast Guards, fishery inspection teams, low-flying planes and helicopters, and of course, surface boats. And we saw some of those in action um, in Sea Spiracy and in uh, the Lobster Wars as well, although not as much, uh, with mus as much intensity, okay? So surface boats. And I have this picture in your notes, just giving you a little visual. So the air patrol team um, spots the unusual activity, and then they communicate to the surface boat, and then the surface boat intercepts the ship. And that's typically how it works. I don't know why this is coming through like this, but okay. <laughs> So you've got advantages and, whoa, hello, disadvantages of um, air and sea patrolling. So they can 
provide, you know, all of a sudden they they appear. So they a little warning and working together as a team, but there is a high financial cost and um, cannot cover everywhere at the same time. And of course, this fishing vessel could have seen this helicopter coming for a few miles. And at that time, they could have dumped over their illegal things. I knew people in New York with my clamming permit that I showed you last week who had illegal clams, too small, on their boat. And when they saw the police boat coming, they pushed them overboard. They were in uh, sacks, bushel, ba bushel bags. Um, so, and they, they knew exactly where they pushed them overboard. And then they pushed the boat a few feet down the way and they didn't have any evidence on board. And then when the police boat left or the, the constable, you know, whoever it was, the federal uh, fish and wildlife, whoever it was coming, it's because there's different entities. Um, they went back later and they got their illegal catch still. I, I know people who did that in New York. Because, you know, even though they're smaller, you, you can still sell them and make money. All right, so now we're doing inspection of catch and fishing gear. So we're talking about log books and why. All right, so fishermen submit the log book to the authority at a regular interval. And it will be checked during random inspection. So, um, they don't never know when it's going to be checked. You, you know, they could be coming back to shore, pull up at their dock, their personal dock, and then all of a sudden from behind the building, the authorities come out and, and immediately seize the log book. Again, not because the fisherman's in trouble or even is suspected of being in trouble, it's a random spot check. And if all the fishermen know that they can be randomly spot checked at any time, maybe they'll think twice about doing anything illegal, right? <clears throat> so they record hours at sea, hours spent fishing, fishing ground coordinates, total catch, and catch after discards. As well as catch landed on quayside. Quayside is the British way of saying dock side or at the dock. And then finally, the catch sold at market. Okay, so I'm uh, turning the page to page 23. So um, yeah, actually no, we're still on page 22, sorry. Uh, this is the bottom of page 22. In the United States and the European Union, a paper log book, paper log books are being and have been replaced by electronic uh, e-log books for ease of use, waterproof, data protection and security, and instant data access. And they can transmit the data to the international monitoring authorities via satellite technology. So they can continue, they can continue that way. Seems easier to, I guess you could do it, you could, you could fudge it, you know, fake it either way, right? All right, so inspecting and catch of fishing gear, catch inspection. So, this is the duty of the catch inspector, to perform catch inspection on the boat, dockside, quayside, and the market, observe fishing practices, uh, ensure the logbook records are correct, examine the size of the fish, and that all fish sold now have a record of location and time they were caught, fishing method used, and the boat that they came from. So you've got on-the-spot inspections and quayside and market inspections. And again, advantages and disadvantages. So those random checks and fish records are all kept, again, expensive to carry out. You have to hire the people and train them to do so. And you gotta get boats and oftentimes they're armed. So you have to train them how to use firearms and then insurance and all that stuff. Um, and then the fisheries, they, it's not that they may distrust, they do distrust the inspectors. Record falsification, um, so on and so forth. All right, satellite tracking. So, 
the automatic identification system, the AIS. So fill in AIS in your notes in the parentheses. This uses navigation and communication satellites so ships can communicate electronically with each other and with authorities on shore. Now it was originally used for maritime security, but like many things that are used for, for military purposes first, like GPS, for example. You, uh, you didn't have GPS in your phones or in your cars um, back in the early 90s and definitely in the 80s, didn't have that stuff, but the military did. The military had global positioning satellites around the whole planet and they still, but then they opened it up to civilians for logistical purposes, for mapping and all that things. And, and so now G GPS is everywhere. Used by fishing vessels to broadcast ships, identification data, position, like where they are, course, where they're going, speed, and their e-log book as well. And I put this picture, uh, this diagram in your notes as well, so you can get a generalized view of all the different parts that play in this vessel management system for monitoring fisher, fishing activity. Now, fishing regulators use the AIS, the Automatic Identification System, uh, as part of a vessel detection system, as it can transmit real-time information about the activities of each ship. So when I was in a NOAA vessel, and I told you that uh, oftentimes we were allowed to go up on the bridge, and they showed us around. Well, they had this big screen and with little dots, and, and the dots had numbers. Those numbers were the part of this vessel detection system. And they were a government vessel, so they could see all the pings of the numbers of the vessels, and then of course you just touch it, and it brings you up all the information on that vessel. What it's doing, what it is, is it a cruise ship? Is it a fishing vessel? What are they fishing for? Who's the captain? Who owns it? Uh, and so on and so forth. It's really kind of cool. So you can, call them on the radio and communicate. It's, it's really neat how advanced the technology is. Information in the e-log book can be transmitted via satellite and if a ship is causing a concern, um, the patrols can be sent out to get more information. All right, now we're moving on to that last one. Okay, we still have advantages and disadvantages. I forgot about that. Okay. Um, Advantages are all the things we talked about, detailed information, areas, uh, all areas all the time, and then costly, obviously. Not every boat has a technology, so if you are a small time fisherman, maybe you know, with one boat, you don't, you're not gonna have this technology. You're not gonna be able to afford it. It does not replace manual inspections which still need to be carried out. All right, here's the catch per unit effort. C P U. In other words, how much effort has gone in to harvesting this particular catch, catch per unit effort? It's a measure of fish abundance, and it's calculated by that equation. So you need to fill that equation out. Um, it's fish catch, and that comes from the log books and the fish markets, which again can be falsified, right? Divided by fishing effort and that is uh it's difficult to standardize really it's considered days spent fishing size of the engine size of the boats number of traps set so on and, and some other um, input there fishing catch versus fishing effort and so what do they use the cpue for We'll get to that in a moment. Okay, so here are some um, graphs that you should know how to uh, read and analyze. So, trend and catch per unit effort. Number of fish per 100 hooks of yellowfin, albacore, and big eye tuna by a Korean tuna longline fishery in the Pacific Ocean from 1975 to 1990, okay? And so all the, the three different fish in question are all, um, here in the key, all right? So this one that's kind of stands out 
is your albacore tuna. And you can see, so how many fish per 100 hooks, all right? And uh, you can see the levels, you can easily trace them. So if you had a question on a test about this type of uh, graph, and they asked you, in 1981, you know, how many big eye tuna were caught, you know, per hundred hooks, something like that. You just, you know, read up and you go to where the big eye is, which is right there. And it's like 0.3, okay? So pretty easy graphs to read. Same thing here, catch per unit effort. Is it a little different? This is with fishing gear. Per, so that was with one type of fishing gear, okay? Which, um, so this is, huh, that's supposed to say, whoops, that's supposed to say a name of a place. It does in your notes, I think. Does it? Maybe it doesn't. No, it doesn't. I take that back. Okay, anyway, it's somewhere in India, Bangladesh, somewhere over there. Okay. Anyway, the difference between that last graph and this one was each one of these is a type of fishing gear. Not just, that last one was one type of fishing gear versus amounts of different species of fish. So for example, here are some examples. HL is hook and line. GN is gill net. TR is trawler, which we know is the most destructive form of fishing. Um, and then lift net. And I don't, I'm not sure what the other ones are. Um, but anyway, so and then this is um, different kinds of fish caught per day, per gear, per day, per person in those diff in those diff with those different um, types. So it's pretty interesting. All right. So here we go. This is the bottom of page 23. It can be used as monitoring tool to assess the health of fish stocks. Helps authorities to evaluate current restrictions and enforcement. And so if the CPU increases, so the catch increases, CI, um, the fishing effort decreases. Fishing effort, CI, catch increases, fishing effort decreases. Indicates the stock is increasing. You don't need to work as hard to get more fish. That means the stock is going up, okay? If the CPUE decreases, okay, catch per unit effort, catch decreases, fishing effort increases. So you're working harder and getting less fish, right? that means the stock is decreasing. So the, this is kind of the key to this whole measurement. I would highlight that, circle it, underline it, whatever in your notes at the bottom of page 23 there. All right, top of page 24, last page. So these notes are kind of quick today. Penalties. No, we're not there yet. I did it again. Advantages and disadvantages, okay? Um, and relatively simple measure. However, it's difficult to standardize. That's the key, okay? And some of it may be due just to natural population fluctuations, which is hard also to measure. Okay, so now we're on um, penalties. Da da da. So these are, they vary obviously between countries. Uh, the European Union, because this is Cambridge, has a point system. Penalty points are added to the license of the fishers to commit offenses. It's very similar to points on your driving license, which you all know about, especially you people who are driving. Um, and if you get so many points, then you get fines or you lose your license or jail time, you get arrested, okay? You, you can be banned from fishing for a certain period, kind of time out from fishing for you. Um, and again, you can get your gear taken. They'll take your boat. They will confiscate your boat. 
And like, not sometimes temporarily, depends on the infraction or the number of infractions or warnings you've been given. Hey, they might be like, hey, next time you do this, your boat's ours. And then you're done, right? So, um, did you get everything there? Sorry. Confiscation of boats, fishing gear, and then imprisonment. Just write, you can write prison, that's fine, or arrested. Um, so, advantages and disadvantages, again, holy cow. You might think there would be a question on your uh, A level papers about, you know, discuss the advantages and disadvantages of some particular topic that we're discussing here, okay? So, um, I'm gonna leave that up to you to come back to that. But again, it's, you could probably easily do it. Just from all the experience you've had in this class and hearing everything. All right, so consumer awareness. And this is probably, this is the key. What is it, what is, it, what is consumer awareness? What's another word for consumer awareness? So it's an E, you're in an institution of such thing right now. Yes, education, or education for some of you. Um, so consumer awareness, how educated are the, because that's what drives the, the whole thing, right? The consumers, it's, it's want and then provision, okay? It, the want, not the needs, I wish it was the needs, but it's the want that drives the, the fishers to, to, to act the way they do. If we wanted different things or less things, then the fisher and this fishing industry would change. You would hope, right? And we're talking about sustainability here, but we learned that sustainability is something that very hard to grasp nowadays. So, but people are, just from being in this class, all of you are, should be, should be becoming more increasingly interested to know things like the origin of your food. Where did your food come from? You go to a restaurant and you see fish and the first thing you ask, it's completely logical and done all the time. Don't feel out of place. Don't feel like you're being uppity or anything like that as long as you're being nice. Ask the waiter or the chef, but the waiter will ask the chef or the manager, Say, hey, can you, do you, can you tell me where the mahi comes from? The mahi-mahi, the dolphin fish? Is it locally caught? You know, where does it come from? And if they can't answer it, or if they say, no, it's not locally caught, it was caught somewhere else and shipped here, or whatever, don't buy it. Say, okay, never mind, uh, I'll buy something. You have any local caught fish? Um, how was it obtained? Shrimp, for example. Were these shrimp uh, farmed or were they wild caught? Either way is bad, we learned, right? Wild caught is wasteful because of by bycatch. And farmed is destructive and to, to mangroves and to estuaries. And if it's from another country, you, it, your shrimp could be blood shrimp from slave labor, right? And then how environmentally friendly is it? So, I mean, look for the labels. We know these labels don't mean squat anymore, do they? They don't mean anything anymore because they're all politically and monetarily, economically oriented. It's, it disgusts me to even look at these labels anymore, right? So, um, and again, in the environmental groups, you can't rely on them. You can't rely on them. Unless you know the person who runs it personally and you can attest to their, their um, ethical code, then you can't trust any of them. So giving money to them probably puts the money in the pockets of politicians. Tuna that has been caught by pole and line and dolphin friendly method is now often labeled as such to inform consumers. <laughs> Same thing, right? But it, it's true, pole and line will not hurt dolphin. 
You can say that. That's one thing you can say. But this by itself means nothing. You'd have to know that that company is only fishing with pole and line, okay, and not nets. And again, these labels, we've, we've seen this in the video. We haven't seen these. This is from, I got this uh, from the website from Whole Foods, okay? This is Seafood Watch, and Whole Foods does not carry any of these. They, obviously, they're not going to have any red labels, but they do have green labels and yellow labels. And I, when I go to Whole Foods, if, if I ever do, if I ever did in the past, um, I would get green labels only because that's the best choice. It's the most economic, not economically, sorry, environmentally sound method of collecting fish. Um, but I'm, I don't know, I, I don't, I'm not going to anymore. If I want fish, I think I'm gonna go catch it myself. I have everything I need, my license and a fishing pole. And it's fun. <laughs> so, um, Maybe I'll do that this weekend, and I'll show you guys what I caught, okay? If consumers choose to buy seafood that has been harvested using sustainable environmentally aware methods, those fisheries will make profit and expand. The ones that are doing the right thing, or at least as right as they can, okay? It's better than the ones who aren't doing anything or, or are faking it, right? Again, it's hard to know as consumers. Got to do research. Got to be like that guy Ali on that video, Seaspiracy, and sit down at a computer and actually do some reading. And not just say, I'm hungry. I want a McDonald's filet of fish sandwich. Ugh, please don't tell me you eat that crap. Um, or the fish sticks that come in boxes. Stop asking your parents to buy those. Because I'll bet my entire salary that those were not fished um, sustainably. Okay? So, however, food certified as sustainable often carries a price premium. We know that as well. If you've ever been to the fish market, you know that fish is expensive. Um, not all consumers are prepared to pay more or educate themselves. That should be in there as well. Like these things. You may like the way these taste. Big value. Buy it at Walmart. Please don't buy anything living at Walmart. Produce, meat, or once alive, you know, fish, no, no, <laughs> no. I know it's gonna cost a little bit more money to shop elsewhere, I don't know, eat less or whatever, or go fishing. Processing, anything in a box is too highly processed and you don't wanna eat it anyway, right? And you do have a question there in your notes, um, that you have to answer in this section, but you can do that later, all right? So uh, there are many organizations that issue guidelines to consumers who put ratings, different products, you know this. Uh, Marine Stewardship Council, that's this one. This is the one that's used in um, Europe and the European Union. OceanWise, Sea Choice, Seafood Watch, this is the one, Monterey Bay Aquarium, this is the one that um, Whole Foods uses. But unfortunately, all those organizations, it gets very confusing. And that's pr pretty much what they, they're hoping for. They're hoping that the consumers, remember most people have an intelligence of 100, and then there are, there are people who are more intelligent and people who are less intelligent. And they're shooting for that majority of people who have average to lower intelligence, and they want them to be confused. They don't want them to do too much research. They don't want them to be informed about the, that these don't have much meaning to them anymore. Maybe they never did, actually. You know what I liked about that video was that woman who talked about plant-based uh, nutrition and how they're replicating seafood that's plant-based, that doesn't you know, affect the environment at all. So advice given by four different North American species, different groups for North American species and methods of fishing. So you can see Marine Stewardship Council says everything's wonderful, best choice. Ocean wise, no, these for these two. Seafood watch, these are 
uh, not recommended, watch avoid, okay? So this, is, this just shows how ridiculous it is. What are they basing their information on if there's such a difference? <clears throat> Again, advantages, disadvantages. Okay, consumers are advised, sustainable food can make informed decisions. Um, so getting the general public involved, right? Disadvantages, only when consumers are informed. Most don't care. I want fish, I want that, give me it now. Yum, 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 pay, pay, pay. I mean, serious, that's how dumb it is. Um, and conflicting advice, not prepared to pay for sustainable food, same with organic food. Um, may not engage with the schemes, so large scale buyers like Walmart and large, you know, uh, McDonald's, okay? And then processed, processed foods. Okay, so we are on long term and short term sociological and economic impacts of restrictions on fishing and of unrestricted fishing. Okay. That's supposed to say sociological, not sociologica, L. Um, so, um, sociological and economic, I don't think I have to define those, even though they're here. We, I think you guys are uh, understanding about what those differences are. Sociological is social problems, human society, and economic is economics. And justified in terms of profitability. So here's the notes that you have to take. Um, so fishing, so fishing regulations have major impacts on the fishers who are the principal stakeholders, right? And, but it's not only the direct employees who are affected. It's kind of like an apex species. The fishing industry in some of these towns, Lobster Wars talked about this, but so did uh, Sea Spiracy. Um, how the entire town is built on the fishing industry. Everything, the schools, the police department, the hospital, um, the businesses, the local hardware store, all of it built on the fishing industry. It's very similar to, if you're familiar with uh, Gainesville, Florida. Gainesville, Florida would not exist without the college. The entire town is built around the existence of the college. It's the same thing with Orlando. The entire city is built around the existence of Disney World. And if it wasn't for Disney World, nobody would live there. And the other little parks that are around that came after Disney World. The only reason Universal is there and SeaWorld is there is because Disney World was there first. And so if you take away or reduce the ability of the fishers, everything else will suffer. The other economy will suffer, right? And that's what this is all about. Okay, so if the fishing industry fails, all the other industries are affected, which can result in unemployment, poverty, should be a comma right there, and the loss of the whole community, or a loss to the whole community. Maybe not, maybe not a total loss, but... And that's what it's all about. That's, that's why it's so complicated. Do we, the, very similar things happen with the coal mining industry in certain parts. For example, Allentown, Pennsylvania, once they shut the coal mine down, this, the steel industry went, went away. And then all of the whole towns shut down. People moved away. People went bankrupt. And then finally, rehabilitation method. So um, methods need to be employed since restrictions on fishing alone may not be enough to fully recover the decline fishing population. Okay, so um, we are going to do this next part in a different way, like I said before. So we're going to talk about all of these things, we did talk about some of these already actually, replanting mangroves, building artificial reefs, I don't think we have to discuss those too much. Um, introduction and cultivated stock into the wild, we have to discuss that still. But that's gonna be part of your project for uh, later this week, on Wednesday and Thursday. So that's it for notes for now. <clears throat>